and uh, God is good, amen, and all the time, He is good, He is good and He is faithful, it's such an honor and privilege to be with you tonight, and I thank God for this opportunity, and I just want to say again, thank you, Brother Blankenship, for, for uh, allowing us to come and for lending me your pulpit on this, uh, on this Wednesday evening, I don't take that for granted, never, and uh, uh, just want to uh, give honor tonight to, to the Lord Jesus Christ for His goodness and His mercy and uh, for this great salvation. Amen. God has been good to us all and, uh, and uh, my, 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 just couldn't tell it all. Just couldn't tell it all. We are, uh, we're happy to be here tonight and uh, looking forward to what the Lord has in store and in this service. I, we'll be going to the Word of the Lord in just a few minutes and, uh, and uh, for a short Bible message, I do want to take just a few minutes here and give you some, just some information about the work that God is doing in Africa. Uh, great, great and amazing, amazing place and a absolutely amazing people, the people of Africa. I don't know if you, how much you may know about Africa or the people of Africa, but uh, it's a big place. It's a big place and uh, for 20 years, almost 21 years, my wife and I were missionaries living in a country, a small country called Togo in West Africa and uh, our initial call to the mission field was to the dark-skinned French-speaking people. It was very specific, and uh, for 20 years, a little over 20 years, we focused primarily on ministering among, working among, living there, and uh, reaching the dark-skinned French-speaking people, not only in Togo, but in about 14 other French-speaking nations all across West Africa and even stretching down into Central Africa. Saw God do some absolutely amazing things, and uh, and uh, and the work continues, and it goes on even today. Uh, but a couple of years ago, our former regional director and his wife, Brother Jerry Richardson, uh, decided it was retirement age, and uh, he retired. and And uh, the Global Mission Board asked my wife and me to take the responsibility of as regional directors for all of Africa, something I never dreamed of, never imagined, never aspired to. Uh, but uh, I tell people this all the time, God knows what he's doing. And uh, I promise you that's one situation I hope God really did know what he was doing. But, uh, but uh, we've, uh, uh, so we've stepped into some big shoes and uh, uh, big responsibilities, that's really the thing, the big responsibilities. Africa today, the population of the continent, and for those of you who didn't study geography in school, if there are any, Africa is a continent, it's not a country. And uh, there's, last time we counted, there were 53 countries, and that's unless another one split and divided in the last few hours, which is possible, but, but uh, 1.2 billion people on the African continent, 1.2 billion, and uh, that's a lot of people, a lot of people, and uh, about one-seventh of the world's population is on the African continent. Uh, there has been for many, many years just an absolute explosion uh, in the growth of population in Africa, so we have a lot of children and a lot of of young people, a lot of children and a lot of teenagers. In fact, statistics show that 50% of the total population of Africa is under the age of 18. Just let that settle in a little bit and think about that. Under the age of 18, that means we've got about 600 million children and teenagers in Africa. That's more than all of the population of the United States and Canada combined under the age of 18. And that just continues. It's just a population explosion. A lot of people 
ask the question, well, why does the African family, why do they have so many children? Uh, well, one of the reasons that they have so many children in Africa is because they know that all of those children that they have, they know they're not all going to survive. In fact, the mortality rate among infants is so high and the families literally, seriously, they know that they're not all going to, to survive. So they have a lot of children. But that's one of our greatest challenges is reaching Africa's children and youth. But I believe that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Amen. And um, I believe God's going to help us to reach Africa's children and youth. We're doing a lot of things to really step up our efforts. And when I talk about Africa, uh, you know, presently we have united Pentecostal churches and I'm not talking about just one single church in fact I looked at the annual field reports for last year just looked at it last week uh, presently we have a little over 800,000 believers in Africa almost 1 million baptized in Jesus name and filled with the Holy Ghost to God be all the glory amen and uh, uh, so God is going to help us, and we're, we're doing a lot of things to step up our efforts to reach Africa's children and youth. That's 50% of our population. So we had better be doing all that we can, and we should be expending about 50% of our efforts to reach half of our population under the age of 18. So one of the things that we're doing we are planning next year, we're going to begin in all 42 of those nations. Uh, we're planning to have a teacher training seminar in all of those nations. That, that would be 42 of those. Uh, teacher training seminars to teach our teachers how to be more effective in teaching and reaching the children and the youth. So the teacher training seminars, will uh, uh, we will be training and teaching our teachers the children's ministry teachers as well as the youth teachers and uh, that's a major project for us and we're going to we're going to take those training uh, seminars uh, classes to every one of those 42 nations and uh, believe God's going to help us that's that's really more effective it's really a it's really more effective because the teachers that we're going to be teaching they already speak all of the languages that we North American missionaries will never be able to speak. They understand the culture. They understand the, the situations and circumstances. So we would ask you to pray with us that God would, that God would help us to, to reach Africa's children and youth. And uh, we are, as well as we travel around and visit churches and deputize, we are also enlisting sponsors for those training uh, uh, teacher training seminars and uh, for five hundred dollars we've estimated that it'll cost about five hundred dollars on the ground to host one of those teacher training seminars in one of those 42 nations and uh, so if you'd like to help with that and be a part of that we would appreciate it very much and I know God would also bless you for that and especially we we desire your prayers that God will help us to, that God will give us the strategies, that God will give us the understanding and the direction to be able to reach 600 million children and young people. Amen. Brother Etheridge, is that, is that video going to, is it going to work? If it does, could we just go ahead and go there? This, this, this short video also, it, it kind of focuses on another particular people group in Africa. Uh, you'll excuse me or you'll indulge me to, to speak about Africa tonight. But this focuses on another people group that we are, uh, that we're focusing a lot of our efforts on reaching.
when I put on my sandals, I must first put on the right foot. When I enter the mosque, I must enter first with the right foot. When washing before prayer, I must wash my right hand, then left hand. Then the feet, starting with the right foot. Only after I am completely clean can I pray. And when praying, I must stand foot to foot so that the devil cannot enter through the gaps. Five times a day I pray and follow these rules because I am a Muslim. I have always been a Muslim. My family, my friends, everyone I know has always been a Muslim. We know of no other way. I live beside the ocean. I am a fisherman. I rise early every morning with a call to prayer and go out on my boat. I love the ocean. It brings me peace and it helps provide for my wives and my children. I return to sell my catch at the market. I bargain for the best price, but there's no bargaining with fate when I catch nothing that day. If Allah wills that I catch nothing, then who am I to question his judgment? And yet, there are even more important questions that I'm not supposed to ask. I hope I'm a good Muslim, for someday I will be judged by Allah. I'm fated to go to heaven or to hell, but I cannot know which. It is a terrible thing not to know if my life of following the rules of Islam will be good enough. I try hard, I say the shahada, I do the prayers, I give to the poor, I fast, but is it enough to earn Allah's mercy? I cannot know until it is too late. I used to feel peace as I watched the sunset. But now, at the end of the day, as the shadows grow, so does my uncertainty. a lot of publicity about this particular group of people in, in the world today, but there is a tremendous, tremendous need. Can you imagine, can you imagine having so much uncertainty about your 
eternal salvation and about the God that you serve. Those feet that you saw walking along beside of that man, um, it is the responsibility of the church to at least, if those are not your feet, if they're not my feet, then it's our responsibility to send those feet. Amen? Are you understanding what I'm saying? And it could very well be that the feet that you saw walking up beside him, it could be that those feet represent the feet of someone in this service tonight. Because God is calling and God is sending laborers into his harvest. And you don't have to cross the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean to reach the harvest. Sometimes it's just cross the street or cross the aisle in the supermarket or in the workplace. Amen. Your mission field may be right here in Norfolk, Virginia or in this county or in this area of the state. Amen. One thing, one of our greatest needs in the Africa region is helping hands. And uh, we offer a lot of opportunities if you are interested in short-term missions work or maybe your God is dealing with you or has dealt with you about, about getting involved in missions. Maybe you'd like to take a trip. There are a lot of opportunities. Uh, there are next steps. Uh, the, the next steps, actually, there's the, uh, the AYC uh, trips. There are two AYC trips going to Africa next year. One is going to the country of Malawi. The other is going to the country of Ghana. Uh, that's a two-week venture. Then the next step after that is actually next steps, which is a two-month. That's a summer program. Next year there'll be a next steps program in the country of Tanzania in East Africa. And of course there's the AIM program. Just a lot of opportunities. If you have a desire, if you have a burden, uh, and if you feel that God is dealing with you or has dealt with you about getting more involved outside of the walls of your local church. If you've got a talent, if you've got a ministry, I promise you Africa can match it with a need. Amen? And if you'd be interested in knowing more about that, you'd be happy to share some information with you after the service. We're going to go to the Word of the Lord tonight, and I do want to say again I appreciate this opportunity. But as you're turning uh, in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, let me, let me give you these, uh, these numbers as you're standing. Last year in Africa, this is all over Africa, there were 42,300 people baptized in Jesus' name. Last year in Africa, there were 46,850 filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. To God be the glory. This is what's so exciting to me about that. Of course, that's, that's, that's big numbers, and I know that. But uh, I, I get excited about this. That's an average, listen carefully, that's an average of 115 people baptized in Jesus' name every 24 hours in Africa. That's an average of 128 people baptized with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost every day, 365 days out of the year. I think that's pretty awesome. I said, I think that's pretty amazing. Amen. That's the equivalent of a, that's the equivalent of a of good-sized church uh, baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost every day of the year. Amen. So we thank God for that. Let's go to the book of Hebrews and uh, Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, I will mention also as you're turning to Hebrews 7, we're going to begin reading verse number 23. Uh, missionaries on deputation are always soliciting partners in missions and uh, we depend on churches like you to partner with us to help us to go and reach the people God is calling us to uh, someone said it this way some give by going others go by giving uh, but we all have a responsibility to the great commission and uh, we would ask you to prayerfully consider partnering with us so that we can continue to do what the Lord has called us to do. Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse number 23, and I read, 
And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Would you say that, to the uttermost? He's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he, suffered, when he offered up himself. And I want to focus on verse number 25. He's able also to save them to the uttermost. And I want to give for a title for this Bible message on this Wednesday evening to the uttermost, to the uttermost. Would you pray with me before you're seated and would you ask the Lord to speak to us tonight through His Word. Lord Jesus, we love you and praise you and bless your name. God, we ask you tonight in the name of Jesus to open our understanding to your Word and I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us and help us to hear what the Spirit would say unto the church. I pray, Lord God, that you would do a special work in the lives of this dear people tonight and I pray Lord that you would guide our feet according to your will and purpose and everyone said in Jesus name God bless you you may be seated let me take just a couple of minutes here and give you a little bit of context in in this Bible reading in the book of Hebrews chapter 7 the book of Hebrews was actually a letter written to the early Jewish Christians uh, these were those early Jewish Hebrew believers who converted from Judaism to what we call today Christianity. Now, of course, this was before they actually uh, put the label or the title on that Christianity. But these, this letter was written to those Jewish believers who converted from the practice, the faithful practice of the law of Moses to what we call today Christianity. They had converted. They had left the teachings of the law of Moses, not abandoned, but they had understood. They had received a revelation. They had, God had taken them a step further. And they had stepped out of Judaism, and now they were walking in what commonly was called at that time, they were walking in the way which was this, what we know today as this great and wonderful salvation of forgiveness of sin and baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And these Jewish believers, these early first century Hebrew believers, they were facing a great temptation. And the great, one of the great temptations they faced was the fact that the temple was still standing. The temple still existed in Jerusalem. It was still on the Temple Mount. The, the sons of Levi and the descendants of Aaron, they still performed their daily ritual sacrifices and their ceremonies and their daily, daily duties at the temple. The brazen altar was still in the outer court. The brazen laver was still there. In the holy place, the golden candlestick was still there. The, golden, uh, the table of shoe bread was still there. And the golden altar of incense was still there. And uh, uh, albeit the Ark of the Covenant was no longer there, but, but uh, the temple was still there. And that represented a great temptation for these Hebrew believers. And some of them, many of them, were tempted and they were, there was a lot of pressure put on them by their families and their friends and their fellow countrymen to return to Judaism because this Jesus had died and he no longer existed to them. Are you following me? So there was a great temptation because the temple was still there. 
It would be like, let's say, someone who was an alcoholic before their conversion. And uh, the bar room where they hung out and the bar room where they would meet with their friends and drink themselves into a stupor was right on the way to church and they had to actually pass in front of that bar room before they could get to the church. You can imagine what a temptation and what a, what a challenge that would be. They would probably need to change their route and just go a different way. But the existence of the temple was a great temptation to these Hebrew believers. And the purpose of this letter, the reason the writer, whether it was Paul, many people think it was the Apostle Paul, I have no problem with that, but there's no proof. But, uh, but the writer of Hebrews was attempting to encourage these early believers, to encourage them and to convince them that this new salvation, this great salvation, you remember earlier in the book of Hebrews, the writer said, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So he's trying to convince them not to abandon the way, not to turn back to the dead practices of Judaism, not to go back to the empty practice of the law of Moses, not to go back to those empty sacrifices, not to go back to those empty rituals. I don't know about you tonight, but I'm still excited about being born again of water and of the Spirit into this great kingdom of God. I'm still excited about going to heaven. Anyone else still excited about the hope of heaven? And so that's what the writer is doing in these, in these verses that I read to you. Therefore, when the writer is saying, for they truly were many priests, he's talking about Aaron and the descendants of Aaron. They were many priests because, he said, they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. In other words, it's, it's really, it's simple. Aaron was no longer there. Now the sons of Aaron or the descendants of Aaron, they were there. But every time when Aaron died, his son took his place. And when Aaron's son died, his son's son took his place. And when he died, someone else took his place. And when he died, someone else took his place. Because they were not allowed or not suffered to continue because they were just men and they died and someone else had to take their place. And the point the writer is making here is that we have a greater high priest. Hallelujah. Who We have a greater high priest and, and who gave a, a superior or a better sacrifice. His point in the book is there is a better covenant. There is a better sacrifice that, was, uh, that gave a better blood, if you please, that, uh, that, that secured a better salvation than that of the law of Moses. And that's why the writer comes around in verse 25 and says, he, wherefore he, talking about Jesus Christ, he is able, would you say that tonight, he is able. We're not talking about Cain's brother here. We're talking about, hello. I said we're not talking about Cain's brother, Abel. We're talking about he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. No matter what your need is, no matter what your circumstances or situations may be, he is able. So he's saying he is able. To save them to the uttermost. And that's really, that's a strong word when he used that word uttermost. The Amplified Bible says this in verse number 25. Therefore he is able also to save to the uttermost completely, perfectly, finally, and for all time and eternity. I kind of like that. In other words, he's not going to get you halfway in and then drop you somewhere along the way. He's able to save you to the uttermost. 
not save you part way, not save you halfway, not save you 95% of the way, not save you 99.9% of the way, but he's able to get you out of this, this world of sin. He's able to deliver you. He's able to clean you up. He's able to strengthen you, and he's able to keep you every day through every situation and every circumstance, any sickness, any problem, Come on, someone. I wish someone would shout unto the Lord, hallelujah, because he is able to save us to the uttermost, completely, perfectly, finally, once and for all. And don't worry, I'm not talking about the unconditional doctrine of eternal security here. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about he is able. From the beginning of creation, there has been in the heart of man, in the heart of humanity, a cry that, that, that goes out of the heart of humanity. And uh, that, that, that cry actually in three different aspects of that cry. The first one is humanity. From the very beginning, there's been a cry, give me revelation, give me a prophet, someone to reveal things to me, someone to interpret things for me. Give me a prophet. And the second part of that cry of humanity has been, give me representation. I need someone to represent me. I need someone to stand between me and the Almighty God. I need someone who can stand between and be a go-between. Therefore, give me a priest. I need a prophet and I need a priest. I need someone to reveal to me and I need someone to represent me. And the third part of that cry out of the heart of humanity is give me someone to rule over me. I need a king. I need someone to set things in order. And I need someone to hold things in order. I need someone to lay down the rules and to lay down some guidelines. It's a cry that comes out of humanity from the very beginning even unto this day. And if you were to ask tonight, if you were to go to the Jewish people and you ask the Jewish people who their prophet is, you ask a red-blooded Jewish person, I'm talking about someone who still practices the, the Judaism, you ask them today, who is your prophet? And they will say without fail, they will say Moses. You ask them, who is your priest? And without batting an eye, they will say Aaron is our priest. And by that they mean the descendants of Aaron. And you ask them, who then is your king? And without fail and without hesitation, they will say, David is our king. So you ask the Jewish people, who is your prophet? And they will say, Moses. Who is your priest? And they will say, and who is your king? And they will say, that's why on, the, on their flag they have the Star of David. But if you ask a water baptized in Jesus' name and a Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking, holy living, one God apostolic believer, you ask them who their prophet is and they'll say, You ask them who their priest is, who is our king. Let's clap our hands unto him tonight. Hallelujah. And he's able to save us to the uttermost. In fact, you ask them, who is your savior? And they'll say, who is your shepherd? Who is your redeemer? Who is your healer? Who is your provider? Who is your friend? Who is your lawyer? Who is your judge? Come on, folks. He's all I need tonight. And he's able to save us to the uttermost. So the first thing that I want to mention is this. Jesus saves completely. Can you say that completely? Not half way, not three-fourths of the way, 
not almost, not mostly, but all together he saves completely, body, soul, and spirit. I'm sorry I didn't come here tonight prepared to break it all down between body, soul, and spirit. I just come to tell us tonight he's able to save us to the uttermost. Doesn't matter what you're going through. Doesn't matter what you may go through in life. You just need to keep that in mind. He's able to save you to the uttermost. It doesn't matter what the world does. It doesn't matter what the devil does. Jesus Christ is able to save you to the uttermost. I remember reading in the, in the Old Testament, it was a time when the old prophet Elijah would die. The Bible says that, that God let him know that he was going to be taken up uh, into heaven and, it, and his time had come. And he called to him the young prophet Elisha, who would be eventually become his successor. And uh, you, you're familiar with the story he told. He asked Elisha, the young man, what would you, uh, what would you uh, have me do for you before I'm taken away? And Elisha asked for the double portion. You, you, you know the story there. And, and uh, so Elijah, the old man, told the younger man, if you see me when I'm taken out of this world, if you see me when I'm taken up, then your petition or your request or your desire will be granted. Well, then from there on, Elisha, the young man, just stuck to the old man like glue. Praise the Lord, somebody. I, I hesitated on purpose there. I said he just stuck to the old prophet like glue. Can I just pause here tonight and just remind us of something? There's some, there's some mighty powerful things we can learn from our elders. And we need to be respecting them. And we need to be watching their steps. And we need to be imitating their example. So Elisha followed him. They, got to the, they came to the Jordan River and the old prophet Elijah took his mantle and he struck the waters of the Jordan and the waters of the Jordan parted. They walked over on dry land to the other side and, and then the, the chariot of fire and you know the story Elijah's taken up to heaven and Elisha, the mantle fell on the younger man and he walked back to the same river, followed through with the same uh, things smote the waters of the, of the Jordan River. The waters parted and he walked across to the other side. There were some of the sons of the prophets, the Bible says, that were waiting on the other side. And evidently, they maybe, I don't know, maybe they were on a hillside or a sandbar on the, on the Jordan River. I, I don't know. But they were watching. They, they saw the whole thing. They saw them go and uh, they saw uh, Elijah taken up with a chariot of fire, a whirlwind of fire, whatever it was. And they saw Elisha come back across. And they proceeded to, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to tell Elisha that, okay, it's true that God took him up, but they said, let us go and let us search on the mountains because surely we'll find him somewhere on the mountains. In other words, what they were saying, we saw it happen, we saw God take him up, but but we just don't think that God's able to take him all the way to heaven. He probably dropped him somewhere on, on the mountain. Now you can read it in your Bible, in your own Bible. And they went and the Bible said for a certain number of days. And they went and they searched in the mountains. And they searched everywhere for the body of Elijah. But guess what? They didn't find him. You know why they didn't find him? Because he is able to. He is able. I said he's able. So he's going to take you up and he's going to take you out of sin and he's going to take you out of some habits and he's not going to drop you somewhere and he's not going to let you down somewhere but he's able to save you completely once and for all and for all eternity. So he saves completely and he also saves forever. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 11 and 12 if we can put those verses on the screen. Uh, this carries along as well the same 
context that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and every high priest, would you say that every high priest? Every high priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Now, this is going back into the practice of Judaism. This is reaching back into the practice of the law of Moses. And the writer is reminding them that every high priest that ministered in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, or in the temple of Solomon, or presently for them in the temple, Herod's temple, that still existed in Jerusalem. The writer of Hebrews is telling them that every priest stood up daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices over and over and over again. But here's the sad news which can never take away sins. Just someone described it this way, it just... From year to year, from one day of atonement to the next year, the day of atonement, it just continued to roll sin ahead until that perfect sacrifice. Could never take away sin. It just kept pushing them ahead, ahead, ahead to Calvary. And the point that the, that the writer here is making, and he makes it clear here, every priest standeth daily. If you, if you know anything about the tabernacle of the temple, you know there were no, there were no chairs, there was, no, there was no place to sit down in the tabernacle or in the temple. This is the reason why. The priest was never allowed to sit down because he never finished his work. There were rotations for the priest and the Levites and, and uh, the priest would come in and they would do their rotation so many days just like shift work today. They would come in and work their shift however many days it was. Then they go off and someone else comes in and picks right up and they just continue to offer sacrifice after sacrifice. The same sacrifices they did yesterday, they do it today. The same rituals they went through yesterday, last week, they continue to do the same thing this week just over and over again. Never a place to sit down because their work was never finished. Because the sacrifices that they made were insufficient. So there were no chairs. There was, not, there was no place in the tabernacle or the temple for the priest to sit down. Because his work was never finished. To his dying day, someone else would take up his job and continue Offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which could never take away sin. But, let me give you just a quick little Bible study here, just real quick. When you see that word but in your scripture, in your Bible, when you're reading or studying, when you come across that word but, You need to stop for just a minute and you just need to ask yourself a question. What's changing here? Because when you see the word but in the scripture, it's before that, it's usually telling you how things were, but now there's going to be a change. So what it's saying is every high priest, it's like everything is moving in this direction. Every high priest standeth daily ministering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin, but... And now there's a change of direction. Now there's going to be a change in this matter. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice uh, uh, for sins forever, would you say forever? What does it say? He sat down. Do you know why it says he sat down? A lot of people just see the the, the part there about the right hand of God. By the way, it's not talking about that, you know, that the little uh, son God went and sat down on the hand of big papa God. That's not what it's talking about, folks. 
I'll tell you what it's talking about, okay? It's talking about when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and he offered his own blood once and for all for the sins of the world, even the sins all the way back into the law of Moses and all the way back when that big spiritual bulldozer was just pushing it and rolling it all ahead. When he offered that one perfect, spotless, supreme sacrifice, he sat down signifying It is finished. No more sacrifices, no more lambs, no more bloodshed. It is finished. I think we ought to clap our hands under the Lord tonight. He is able to save us to the uttermost. Sometimes when you're facing that situation or that problem or maybe even, you know, the doctor's diagnosis or prognosis is not what you really wanted to hear. Sometimes you just need to remind yourself, but he is able to save us to the uttermost. And when someone comes around or the doctor or the lawyer or the banker, or the neighbor, or the husband, or the wife, or the the son, or the daughter comes around, you know, saying, well, it's not going to work well, and just saying, you can't, or saying, he can't, you need to remind yourself, but he is able to save me to the uttermost. And finally, the final point There are no hopeless cases with Jesus. Okay, he saves completely. He saves forever. And there are no hopeless cases with Jesus. None. No hopeless cases. And that means that even that Man, you know, we watched the video earlier, and that particular group of people, that particular religion that gets so much publicity today, there are no hopeless cases with Jesus. No hopeless cases. Recently, just a few weeks ago, in fact, in one of those countries that is totally Islamic, I'm talking about in Africa. I'm not going to name the country because it, there's, uh, for the security and safety of, uh, of, of people involved. But in one of those countries that is completely Islamic, where it's against the law to have a Bible, it's against the law to have Christian material and literature. Just a few weeks ago, three of the citizens of that nation were baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sin couldn't do it in that nation but they came to a nation where it could be done and they've been baptized in Jesus name and now they've gone back and you know what they're going to do they're going to tell somebody else about this great God who is able to save them to the uttermost And it's going to take away that uncertainty in their minds and in their spirits and in their hearts. It's able to save. There are no hopeless cases. Please stand and let's go to the book of Mark chapter number 5. And Brother Etheridge or whoever's in the sound booth, if we could bring those last few verses on the... This is, uh, you're familiar with the story of the, we commonly call him the demonic of Gadara. Musicians may come. The Bible says that he had his dwellings among the tombs. He lived in the cemetery. He lived in the graveyard. It might be interesting to someone to know that that word tomb in the original Greek language that the New Testament was written in, that word tomb comes from the same root word that where we get memory Okay, in other words, things of the past. 
that's really what a tombstone is, by the way. I'm not being disrespectful. It's really a tombstone is just a monument to something or someone who used to be. And this man had his dwelling among the tombs. In other words, he was haunted and he was tormented by the past. There are basically three periods of life that we have to deal with as human beings, and that's the past, the present, and the future. And we as apostolic believers, we have a great hope. We shouted about it earlier, the, our hope of heaven. We have a great hope. And we somehow, we somehow know that God has our future. He's just got it. Can you just, can you just say amen? He's just got it. And, and I, don't, I don't think we have such a difficult time really grasping the fact that he also, he has our present. He's watching over us. He's keeping us. He's protecting us. He's providing for us. He's just got it. You know what I mean? But I'll tell you the one that, I don't know, but I, I just, I think the one that we struggle with the most is the past. How often the devil likes to come and, and dig up our past again and somehow, you know, just stick it up and just bring it up into our face all over again. And even though we got victory over it years ago and we prayed through about it and God forgave us and we got it under the blood, but the devil has a way sometimes of just taking that skeleton, if you please, out of the closet and just bringing it up again and if we're not careful he'll use the past to totally get us off track in the present and for the future and this man had his dwelling among the tombs and no man do you see that no man could bind him no not with chains because he had often been bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces neither could any man tame him could you skip down to verse number 14 but after he had been with this man called Jesus the Bible says that the people in the countryside they came and they came they come to Jesus and they see him that was possessed with the devil. You know, he's the one who lived in the, among the tombs. He's the one who lived in the graveyard. You remember him? He's the one that no man could tame and no man could keep him in fetters. And they see him that was possessed with the devil and Jesus had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid at that sight. What are you saying Brother Adams? I'm saying there are no hopeless cases with Jesus. Right here in Norfolk, Virginia there are no hopeless cases. In the city you live in, the neighborhood you live in, the place where you work your family, that person, that loved one, that neighbor, that individual that you know that seems to be so far away from God and so caught up with the, with the perversion of this world. There are no hopeless cases with Jesus. Jesus Christ is able to save that person to the uttermost, completely once and for all and for all of eternity. I wonder if we could lift our hands tonight and let's thank this great God that we serve. Let's give thanks unto Him tonight. This is a great salvation. This is a great salvation. He's able to save us to the uttermost. Let's give thanks unto the Lord tonight. Give glory and honor unto the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, we bless your name. We give you glory and honor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. I want you to lift up your voice. Let's sing this chorus together. And would you come join me around the altar as you come? For it reaches to the highest mountain. Can our singers join us, please. And it flows to the lowest valley. Hallelujah. It's the blood that gives me strength. begin to find two or three people around you begin to pray for one another in the name of the Lord ask God to strengthen their walk strengthen their salvation strengthen their knowledge of truth hallelujah pray for one another as the spirit of the Lord leads and gives utterance Strengthen the church. Strengthen our knowledge of the word. Strengthen our commitment to truth. That's it. Let the Holy Spirit move among us tonight. It's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose. Oh, hallelujah. To the highest. To 
to the lowest valley. Well, it's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. to lift our voice together and I want us to pray over Africa the continent of Africa the, the, the statistics are just overwhelming and uh, and I, I certainly think that Norfolk Apostolic Church needs to cover one of those seminars for the children's ministry and stuff we'll be doing that but I think we just need to pray uh, for the continent pray for the nations of the continent the work that is faced there is just uh, daunting and yet God is doing a great work but there is such a need of great work and you can imagine endeavoring to do a mammoth job like that in dealing with so, mu so much immaturity of youth it is a, 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 a thing to tackle Take the hand of somebody near you if you'd like to, but either way, lift up your voice. Let's pray for Africa right now. In the name of Jesus. Lord, as a church, we intercede tonight. And we play, pray blessing upon the ministry of Brother and Sister Adams as they represent our churches and work throughout the African continent. God, somehow take these statistics and turn them, turn them to good. Help us to reach these children and young people. In the name of Jesus, God, would you bless all of our seminar and Bible school efforts and our teaching efforts. Help us to teach and to ground and to strengthen doctrine and truth throughout that continent. Oh, hallelujah. Praise. Let's praise him together. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. This church loves missions. Amen. And missions work. And uh, there's nothing closer to the heartbeat of the Lord. And uh, I'm glad the Lord worked it out. Brother and Sister Adams will be with us tonight. And uh, we're going to be a blessing to them and also try to uh, assist with one of these seminar workshops but I wanted to share something with you uh, that I became aware of today but uh, to be here for this one evening with us they had to drive from Akron Ohio to Columbus Ohio then all the way to Norfolk Virginia and after leaving here they drive all the way back up to Stanton I calculated it up, and that's about 16 hours of driving just to be here in this one service. And, and, and they were on time. <laughs> Yay, I say. <laughs> 
but they drive a truck as big as mine. And so if there's anything I know, my truck has a lot of benefits, but one of its problems is it is utterly addicted to gasoline. It is. <laughs> and so we need to, we want to cover that. And so here's what I'm asking you. Uh, I want to cover their gas in the Knights Hotel on top of the other stuff. If you would like to leave an offering toward that, as we often do when we have our missionaries, just when we're greeting one another, just come up and leave it on the pulpit. Uh, but just within a couple of minutes, if you would, because we're going to be wrapping up and, and cleaning up. Thank you for being faithful to the house of the Lord. The called conference is going on the next few days, full operation Sunday morning, Sunday night. No service next Wednesday, but the following Sunday, Evangelist Steve Grimsley is going to be back with us. Greet one another. Shake hands with one another. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. If you'd like to bring a